Welcome back. It is said that more than 600 million people in Africa lack access to basic healthcare services. Realizing the plight of Africans and the urgent need for basic healthcare services, a local doctor has developed a digital health solution called Menga. Menga aims to serve as a bridge between Africans finding themselves in semi-rural areas and access to basic healthcare. Dr. Esperance Lewindau is a medical doctor, health philanthropist, Forbes 30 under 30, digital health consultant, international speaker, and the founder of the One Step at a Time Africa Health Foundation. And she now joins us in studio to talk more about the Menga Initiative. Very good morning to yeah. you. Good morning. And, uh, good thank morning. you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh, what an impressive CV. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm Talked. humbled. Thank you so much. First and foremost, congratulations on, uh, on the launch. And um, I think, you know, for us to understand the present, it would be very good to give us a, just a little, you know, yeah. background story. Mm. Menga, how did it come about? You know, okay. some of my best ideas come from when I'm taking a shower and driving. <laughs> but yeah, talk to us about the birth yeah. of this uh, life changing idea. Okay, so a couple of years ago, we started offering free medical advice. We very quickly realized that, that doesn't solve the problem. So somebody mm. takes you and they say, listen, I've been having a vaginal discharge for the past three months. And then you say, okay, you ask them a couple of questions and say, okay, you probably have a sexually transmitted infection, most likely maybe gonorrhea, uh, but you're not solving the problem because the person still has to leave their home, travel, go see a doctor, Absolutely. get a prescription because uh, you, know, you, you haven't solved the problem. And so I say to myself, okay, is it then possible to develop something that solves the problem full circle so that somebody sitting in an informal settlement far away or semi-rural area can then consult their doctor mm -hmm. and then access their prescribed medication so that you solve the problem full circle. I started working on it. It was an idea. There were a lot of loopholes. I approached a lot of software developers and I was getting told it's not possible because mm. obviously there, there's a lot on the back end you have to ensure. Yeah, you have yeah. to ensure that only one person gets access to the medication. How do they access it? Is uh, it biometrics? Is it so all these things? Think, yes, yeah, there's so important. much. And so went through a lot of loopholes, a lot of testing, and finally found people overseas that could assist with the development thereof. And we worked on it, we tested it, it works, and here we are. Yeah. Talk yeah. to us about how it works essentially. So mm. I'm experiencing you know what I, what would traditionally be considered an embarrassing situation <laughs> and uh, i don't want to go to uh -huh. the healthcare center but i want uh -huh. you know the 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 the, the, the treatment mm -hmm. talk to me so i'm sitting here with my phone yes. which in most cases uh, most likely be a Tamagotchi. Yes, yeah. I, I love that you said that. I love that you said yeah. that. Okay, so me. you Talk are sitting with your little Tamagotchi. You are in an informal settlement. You will not need internet on your end as the patient. Mm -hmm. You will send a message to our number. There's a doctor on call. Mm -hmm. So the entire consultation will be through a messaging system without internet. Mm -hmm. After which then through biometrics, you will be given access to your medication. You go to your local supermarket at the local Menga or with a local Menga inside. Mm -hmm. and you will then be able to enter your biometrics and get your prescribed medication. The medication will expire after a certain period of time. And also there are systems in place to ensure not just confidentiality, but also to ensure that we track patient statistics, mm -hmm. which is very important because you Absolutely. want to know who you are serving. You want to know what are the major conditions in that area. You want to be able to use it also for research purposes later on. Mm -hmm. So there's that confidentiality that we had to look at. There is data protection we had to look at. Absolutely. And then there's also the access of the medication itself. If you are not the person that consulted you will then not be able to access the the medication so it's very simple but i think it's these simple solutions that drive change mm. Mm. language is one of the mm. questions that have popped up uh, <laughs> in my in my head right now in terms mm -hmm. of like english of course is it's, it's the, the franco lingua mm -hmm. but for somebody who doesn't have the basic understanding of english are they is menga also accommodating them in terms of communicating in the vernacular, maybe Oshuambo, Shero, Kavango, for example. I love that question yeah. because, so OSAT Africa Health Foundation, which is uh, the, the organization that this falls under, mm -hmm. is very much into educating people in their native languages. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is, you know, we used to do outreach and we very quickly realized that, I mean, you're telling somebody about a copper IUCD in English, telling them all these side effects, hormones, progesterone, estrogen, this person does not understand what you're saying. And so we need to learn to educate people in their native languages because that is the language they understand. As Africans, we have our own languages. Absolutely. So we must learn to embrace that. And if we're going to educate people and give people health care, if you want to reduce teenage pregnancy, if you want to increase health uptake, 
take, you need to start meeting people at their point of need. So yes, Menga takes it into consideration. You can consult your doctor and get access to your medication in your native language, which we're so proud of. Mm. Mm. Uh, brilliant. Menga will be present in six other African countries. Talk to us about the need for such innovation mm. on the continent. And you, 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 like you started off, you said it was met with so much resistance. Ah, it will never work. Esperance, what oh. is she thinking again? <laughs> uh, but then you came across people who were like, wait, mm. wait a minute, she's onto something mm -hmm. here. Um, and it's, 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 it's something that I think, you know, speaks to the fact that, you know, Africa has always been at the back end. We're always receiving, but mm. in, we're now seeing instances where Africa is saying like, hey, we have solutions for mm. ourselves as well. Uh, talk to us uh, about that and also just the, the, the spread of Menga mm. across mm. You know, the okay. borders. All right. So, so firstly, to start with, I, 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 I prefer not to say that Menga will be available in six countries. I prefer to say that Menga will be available in all African countries. That's the goal. Uh -huh. The unveiling yesterday happened in six countries, being Namibia, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, DRC, and a few other countries. And that was just the unveiling. But we are working on it in order to ensure that Menga, because the need is a cross cut. It's not just in Namibia. It is all over in Africa. And so the goal is to ensure that anybody in Africa living in an informal settlement, semi-rural area, etc., can then make use of Menga to access their prescribed medication and consult without the conventional method. The need is great. As you started to say, over 600 million people, I had to double check that fact, mm. over 600 million people in Africa and are unable to access basic basic health care and that is a problem also a lot of children uh, hundreds of thousands of children under the age of five die from preventable causes every single year things like dehydration things like pneumonia no. those are preventable things you don't need to necessarily go to a hospital to be seen but it can kill you in seconds or in minutes and so it is important for us to to to, to note that the need varies all the way from children all the way to the elderly mm -hmm. and it is not just in namibia it's all over africa mm -hmm. Now, what would you perhaps attribute that to? I mean, if people are still dying of diseases that were wiped, mm -hmm. that, were, that were, how should I put it, that polio, for example, Prevent, yes. prevented, like, you know, mm. some countries are free from that. Mm. And we're seeing a reinsurgence of it mm -hmm. in some parts of the country. What mm. do we attribute that to? Is it a lack of political will, lack of investment in R&D? Where exactly is the problem? I, I think that the problem lies with, number one, education. I don't think we spend enough time educating people. You know, there the are patients that will, you know, attend one of our Copper IUCD clinics and they'll say, nobody has ever told me about contraceptives. And I'll say, but oh. you, you finished school, you finished high school. Is, how is that possible? You know, there's, there's a lot of education that is lacking and all of it in the name of it's a taboo. Yes. Culture. No, no, we, we can't talk about, you know, at, at an interview I was told, Esperanza, you always give the example about STDs. Can't you use another one? Because it's, <laughs> it's sort of awkward, you know? So we need to get rid of that and we need to start educating people about the needs without being ashamed and calling it taboo. Mm -hmm. Because when people are not educated, they can't take control of their own health. And so it starts with healthcare workers. It starts with healthcare workers, community initiatives. And, and, and by so doing, we can then see improved health education and people taking control of their health better and then reduced obviously incidence of diseases Absolutely. like you've mentioned mm. earlier this mm. week we had the opportunity to speak to professor anisha peters mm. and mm. Uh, we spoke about ai mm. and the difference it can make mm -hmm. in terms of you know speeding up our uh, our development as, as as third world countries mm -hmm. uh, what change do you see ai playing mm -hmm. in the access improving access to to medical care mm -hmm. uh, uh not only in namibia but of course you know across the continent hmm. so there's a conversation around whether or not artificial intelligence is going to replace people and and whether we're doing a bit too much i know that you know even with the launch like this you know you have opinions whereby someone will be like okay but you're taking away jobs and I don't think that's how we should look at it. You see, artificial intelligence is, is, is not a thing of the future. It's a thing of the present. It is taking, not taking over per se, but it is very crucial right now. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody saying, you know, okay, I am applying for a position or role at, at a new job. And I, I know nothing about artificial intelligence. I know nothing. It, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And so we need to integrate it in every sector. Healthcare being very important. And so... 
the role of AI, I would say, is number one, present and not just future. Number two, it can assist to augment the services. So instead of a nurse having to come around, do everybody's blood pressure, do everybody's, and by so doing, we don't realize that we are increasing the burden on health workers and decreasing the quality of services. Whereas when we have automated machines that can continuously be doing that, we leave the mm. nurses to offer better care to the patient. Now I have time to focus on you and I'm not stressed and yeah. moody all the time because I have- or fatigued, patients, yeah. or fatigued, because I have 100 patients to get to. Mm -hmm. You know, even with electronic medical records, that it took so long for Africa to sort of start catching up, you know, where you go overseas sometimes and patients are simply being, uh, you know, seen on an iPad oh. and you enter the information at once. And when you come back, I have your information. I don't have to take notes consistently. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, you mentioned it and said, I, I don't want to use the word behind. We have a lot to do to catch up. And yeah. I don't think we should be looking at AI as the enemy. We have people like, like you mentioned, like uh, Prof. Anisha and, and others that are, you know, skilled in these areas that can assist to say, listen, we want this, but how can we ensure that we use it in a safe manner? And then we have people like myself that have all the ideas and we put these two together and we can make magic. Mm. Yeah. We understand that you've uh, established the Dr. Esperanza Lovindau Healthcare Scholarship <laughs> Award. Uh, briefly talk to us about that and uh, yeah, what inspired it? I am the last born of five children. Both my parents passed away. My father when I was four, my mother when I was six here in Namibia. And I, you know, we were obviously left to fend for ourselves. A group of people, my mother was a teacher at St. Paul's College. And so when she passed, the, the principal, the teachers and a few parents came together and said, we can't just let these kids go, go onto the streets. Let's, let's raise some funds, open a trust fund. And that is how I got through school. Wow. Yes. And, and so I think to myself, if you wait until you are the wealthiest person to give back, you will wait forever. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the money in the world, but I would like to think of myself as blessed to a certain extent. And I want to use the little I have to give back. That is the idea behind the scholarship. Mm -hmm. But I'm very proud of the scholarship because apart from that side, it ties in the health, my health organization. Because in order to qualify for the scholarship, you have to study our health education material on our website, osatafrica.com, okay. in your native language. So oh. breast cancer, contraceptives, and HIV. IV, and then you send an email to us, you book a slot, you write a test. About two weeks ago, we had over 100 women yeah. writing the assessment. In order to pass, you need 80% and above. And once you pass, you were then invited for an interview and then stand a chance to qualify for the scholarship. And the reason for that was strategic to ensure that we're giving scholarships, yes, but we're also using it as an opportunity to educate people and statistically or research evidence-based then because we can say, listen, we've educated 10,000 women mm. on, on these topics and we have the evidence because 80% passed. Wow, oh, awesome. Yeah. Any final uh, uh, sentiments in terms of uh, what you want Namibians to know um, about Menga? Mm. Final sentiments, I definitely say that change can be scary, mm -hmm. definitely, particularly when we're talking about technology. Absolutely. And I, you know, I know that when I was working on this now over the past few years, there was a country in northern Namibia, in northern Africa, pardon me, that, that said, you know, no, this is not possible because we have a policy from 1967 oh. that prevents this. And my response then is, are the policies and legislations not supposed to protect the people? And, you know, before they are good. So if we have things like that, is it not then time that we, we take a look at them and say, okay, we've been working on this and it's worked, it's served its purpose, but now moving forward, we need to set the rules and the measures in place that, yes, we protect the people, yeah. but we don't keep them away from what is good for them. Mm -hmm. Sparance, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And uh, congratulations <laughs> once again and all the best uh, with you. you and uh, the rest of the team. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, that was Dr. <laughs> Esperanza uh, Levendau, medical doctor and also the founder of Menga, talking to us about the, 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 the dream, the, the rationale behind Menga, why it came about and the difference that she hopes it will make in as far as you know, providing essential health care to vulnerable people in far to reach areas uh, is concerned.